Tonight, a deadly attack on American troops and the fear it could be a tipping point. It's another very dangerous step. The U.S. will have to respond. Could it lead to a wider Middle East conflict? Plus, the accusations against a U.N. agency that could worsen the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Faked explicit images of Taylor Swift taken down from social media. But for those who aren't famous, the threat remains. The distribution of such intimate images are a form of sexual violence. Canadian hockey trailblazer reflects on a dream come true. The gravity of what we've accomplished has been absolutely incredible. Sarah Nurse on a new league, Olympic firsts, and the journey that got her here. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. We begin tonight with a dangerous escalation in the Middle East conflict with an attack on American soldiers, the first killed in the region since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. military has confirmed an overnight drone strike took the lives of three American service members and wounded 25 more at a base in northeast Jordan close to the Syrian border. President Biden has vowed the deadly attack will not go unpunished. But at the same time, the White House is desperate to keep the conflict from expanding. Katie Simpson starts our coverage tonight. Out on the campaign trail, U.S. President Joe Biden had to briefly pause his re-election pitch to mark and mourn the loss of U.S. soldiers, honoring the dozens injured, too. We had a tough day last night in the Middle East. We lost three brave souls. Biden called for a moment of silence before vowing to retaliate. And we shall respond. The U.S. says unmanned drones attacked this small base known as Tower 22 in northeastern Jordan along the border with Syria. In a statement, the White House said, we know it was carried out by radical Iran-backed militant groups operating in Syria and Iraq. And we will hold all those responsible to account at a time and in a manner our choosing. This is a very important escalatory step. It's in some ways, it's what we've been worrying about. U.S. soldiers have been targeted in similar attacks, prompting retaliatory airstrikes by American forces. But this is the first time U.S. troops have been killed in the region since the Hamas-Israel conflict began. But it's another very dangerous step because, as I say, the U.S. will have to respond even more strongly than it's done to previous attacks. On social media, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham urged Biden to strike targets of significance inside Iran, adding the U.S. should hit Iran now, hit them hard. House Speaker Republican Mike Johnson wrote, America must send a crystal clear message across the globe that attacks on our troops will not be tolerated. As Biden weighs his options, this moment requires a significant response, according to a former NATO Supreme Allied commander. This is a time to try to cap off the tit for tat, get it stopped, convince the Iranians they can't afford to play this game. Katie, this drone strike is raising concerns about a broadened conflict. Do we have any sense yet uh, who launched it? The U.S. believes the drone itself was launched from somewhere in Syria, and they're in the process of confirming additional details. The Biden administration has repeatedly said it does not want this conflict to expand. And how the U.S. responds in this moment, it could shape whether it does broaden. Canada has troops in the region, and so we checked in with military officials, and they confirmed to CBC News no members of the Canadian Armed Forces were injured or affected in this attack. Ian. Katie Simpson in Washington. Thanks. Canada is among 11 countries now that have suspended funding for the United Nations Relief Works Agency, or UNRWA, triggered by allegations that workers for the agency were involved in the October 7th attack on Israel by Hamas. But as Chris Brown explains, unless donors change course, the UN says it's on the verge of stopping humanitarian operations in Gaza completely. Gaza and its people are being decimated by Israel's military. And now funding for the main humanitarian agency that's been providing food and shelter is under attack too. Israel claims 12 staff members of UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency, took part in the massacres of October the 7th. 
The evidence that Israel shared with Western countries, but not publicly, was enough to convince key donors, including Canada, to suspend tens of millions of dollars in funding. In a statement, the head of the UN urged countries to reconsider. I was myself horrified by these accusations, said Antonio Guterres. I strongly appeal to the governments that have suspended their contributions to at least guarantee the continuity of UNRWA's operations. In Gaza, many said they're shocked at what they feel was a callous move. UNRWA is the lifeline that feeds Gaza, Nahed Balul told a videographer working for CBC News. They're punishing everyone for just a few, said Vadi Abu Ode. In the occupied West Bank, where UNRWA also operates, many felt the timing of the funding cuts on the same day as the UN's top court refused to drop the genocide case against Israel was not a coincidence. Freezing aid to the agency comes to disrupt the decision of the International Court of Justice, said the Palestinian Prime Minister. UNRWA was formed more than 70 years ago to support Palestinians and now their descendants who were displaced when the State of Israel was created. But many Israelis loathe UNRWA, claiming the education system it funds has taught generations of Palestinians to hate Israel. It's also very good at pretending that all these things, uh, such as uh, caches of weapons in its uh, schools, it always pretends as if those are aberrations. Whereas, as they say, this is a feature of the organization. It's not a bug. What's the evidence of that? Chris Gunnis was the UNRWA spokesperson for 13 years. They have been working, frankly, heroically for the last three and a half months. The Canadian government and others who have suspended funding need to understand this is holy, it's vindictive, it's disproportionate, and it's counterproductive. And Chris, the UN wanted to stress that it's already taking action against at least some of the workers. Well, the Secretary General, Ian, says nine of the 12 have already been fired, one is dead, and the identity of two others is being clarified. Some Western nations are continuing to support the agency in the meantime, including Ireland and Norway, who says it's important to draw a distinction between individuals and the mission of the agency itself. Ian. Chris Brown in Jerusalem. Thank you. Canada's ambassador to the UN told CBC News that Ottawa is searching for other ways to meet the humanitarian need in Gaza. We are, as we speak, talking with all those other countries that have taken a position, as we have, to suspend assistance to UNRWA, but not to the overall situation. We want to be very clear that we're going to continue to support the humanitarian situation in Gaza, precisely because it's so serious. And let's not make a political football out of this. It has to do with saving lives. It's not clear what alternatives there are that can match the scale of UNRWA's operations, which the agency says employs 13,000 people in Gaza alone. To a significant development in the investigation into an alleged sexual assault involving five members of Canada's 2018 junior hockey team. Today, former player Alex Formenton surrendered himself to police in London, Ontario, where his lawyer confirms he has been charged. Here's Sarah Levitt with what we know tonight. Wearing a serious expression and flanked by lawyers, Alex Formenton, the former NHL player and member of Canada's 2018 junior hockey team, surrendered to London, Ontario police Sunday. His lawyer, Daniel Brown, confirmed he was charged, along with other players, in connection to an accusation made in 2018. He provided no further details. Last week, the Globe and Mail reported five members of Canada's 2018 World Junior Team were told to surrender to police. The group expected to face sexual assault charges tied to allegations dating back to that year. CBC News has not independently verified the report. According to court documents, the alleged victim, known only as E.M., said she was sexually assaulted by a group of players. None of the allegations have been proven in court. Bailey Reed works in sexual violence prevention and has been watching this investigation closely. It can be really hard for um, survivors to see justice and it can be hard for police to... Um, bring charges forward. I wish it wasn't this complicated, but the system that we currently work with for sexual violence doesn't work particularly well. 
In 2022, the alleged victim sued eight players, Hockey Canada and the Canadian Hockey League, for more than $3.5 million in damages. Hockey Canada settled out of court. As previously reported by CBC News, five players, including Formanton, have now been granted indefinite leaves from their teams. So far, there's no evidence connecting those leaves to the allegations. Today, Formanton's lawyer issued a statement saying Alex will vigorously defend his innocence and asks that people not rush to judgment without hearing all of the evidence. London police wouldn't comment, only saying more details will be given in a news conference February 5th. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. One of this country's political giants was remembered today with tears and laughter and thanks for his decades of service and his dedication to Canadians. A state funeral was held for Ed Broadbent, the longest serving leader of the New Democratic Party. It is a rare honour for an opposition leader. Tom Perry with the memory shared. They came by the hundreds to celebrate a life well lived. Friends, family and former colleagues of Ed Broadbent, a political giant known to so many as just Ed. Ed was uh, an extraordinarily important part of modern Canadian history. Broadbent led the NDP for 14 years. He's only the second opposition party leader after Jack Layton to be honoured with a state funeral. The political heir to both those men, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, remembered how Broadbent welcomed him and how Singh always joked that when he grew up, he wanted to be Ed Broadbent. We will never forget him. And Ed, we won't let you down. And you're still who I want to be when I grow up. Manitoba Premier Wab Kanu says Broadbent pursued what he calls the politics of joy, seeking to bring people together rather than divide them. I hope for the sake of our country that more of our leaders speak to us Canadians the way Mr. Broadbent did, by appealing to our better angels. Ed Broadbent, I hope we will see you again. After stepping down as NDP leader, Broadbent campaigned for human rights at home and around the world. Those who worked alongside him remember a man at ease with everyone. Whether he was talking to factory workers in Bangkok, to indigenous leaders in Guatemala, to Fidel Castro, the Dalai Lama, or the receptionist, you felt important. Broadbent remembered as well for his love of music, his quick wit, and his taste for cigars. But above all, as a man dedicated to building a better Canada and a better world. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. Tomorrow, MPs begin a new sitting of Parliament after winter break. Conservatives are leading in the polls over the Liberals. And as J.P. Tasker shows us, the jockeying for voters' attention is intensifying. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is fired up. Is everybody in this room ready to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget and stop the crime? Rallying his caucus before Parliament's return with pointed attacks on his main opponent, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Canadians are hardworking, decent, honourable people. They don't have to live like this. They don't have to give up the things they used to take for granted, like affordable food and homes in safe neighbourhoods. They don't have to give up those things for the incompetence and ego of one man. Blaming Trudeau seems to be going over well with some voters. Data from poll aggregator 338 Canada suggests Polyev's party has a 13-point lead over the governing Liberals. Those who um, want to change in government and feel comfortable with the alternative has hit an all-time high. In his own address to Liberal MPs, Trudeau acknowledged the parties in a tough spot. We're there listening to people, understanding their frustrations, their concerns. He's framing the Conservatives as a risky alternative. Pierre Polyev is focused on bringing his party further to the right, while we are focused on meeting Canadians where they are. 
The messaging from both parties will be tested in an upcoming by-election in the Toronto area riding of Durham in March. The outcome won't change much, the Liberals are poised to govern until 2025, as long as their agreement with the NDP holds. Things have gotten worse and worse. But Trudeau's also getting an earful from his parliamentary partner. The Liberals and Justin Trudeau are out of touch. They don't know what people are going through and they've had so many years to make things better and haven't. The NDP says it'll prop up the government as long as it pushes through a national pharmacare program. The Liberals have already missed one deadline, but they say they'll deliver in this new parliamentary sitting. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Iran has announced its first successful satellite launch using a rocket system the U.S. fears could one day be militarized. Tehran says the Simorg rocket carried three satellites into low Earth orbit, all for science and research purposes. Iran classifies the Simorg as part of its civilian space program, but the U.S. says the technology could be used to build an intercontinental missile. And in Istanbul, Sunday mass at this Roman Catholic church turned deadly after two people, masked and armed, burst in and started firing. One person was killed, the perpetrators later arrested, but police haven't said what their motive was. Earlier, Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack. The social media platform X has taken down fake, explicit AI-generated images of Taylor Swift after they were widely shared for 17 hours. But as Yvette Brend explains, many victims have few options to respond to this alarming trend. Millions saw explicit images of U.S. pop star Taylor Swift in their social media feeds, and that prompted concern all the way to the White House. We are alarmed by uh, the reports of the, of the circulation of images that you just laid out. The social media site X scrubbed the images and issued this statement. Posting non-consensual nudity images is strictly prohibited, and we have a zero-tolerance policy towards such content. But by then, at least one of the images had been viewed 47 million times. Less high-profile victims often can't get images removed so fast. Their face can essentially be taken and, um, using technology, put on another body that is either nude or engaging in a sexual act. A new act kicks in on Monday in B.C. that will give victims clout to go after both deepfake producers and the platforms that proliferate them. The Intimate Images Protection Act carries fines of up to $100,000. It um, creates a, an expedient and accessible process for individuals um, to get images taken down from the Internet. Experts say it's the toughest tool so far in Canada. Because it addresses maybe more forms of non-consensual images like deep fakes, AI images and live streams. These are the things that are not addressed in other Canadian and worldwide leg legislation. But the legislation relies on victims coming forward. Because a lot of us just suffer in silence and are made to feel like this is a part of being a woman or a gender diverse person. And not everybody has the clout and the resources of a pop music megastar to defend themselves. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. Carthas in Canada are prompting a push for tracking devices. The manufacturer should be putting them in. Why the debate over who's responsible could cost you. Plus, an emerging sport in an old school venue. This is just going to fit what people are looking for. Why a pickleball court may appear inside a mall near you. And a force in women's hockey. A wicked top shelf goal. Helps usher in a new era for the sport. To be able to sit back and say, oh my gosh, I'm a professional hockey player. Um, it's an honor. My interview with Sarah Nurse on the importance of a new pro league. We're back in two. The Mona Lisa was targeted by climate change activists at the Louvre in Paris today. Soup was thrown on the world-famous painting, but the protective glass stopped any damage. The activists said they represented a food security organization. Their aim is to highlight the need to protect the environment and sources of food. The federal government is gearing up to host a national summit on combating auto thefts. As more and more vehicles are stolen, and as Philip Lee Shannock explains, many are calling for new regulations around anti-theft devices. 
Jeep owners adore their rides, and so too, it turns out, do thieves. My previous Jeep, which I love, love, loved, was stolen the first week I bought it. Her insurance company said she'd have to pay a surcharge for the next one or outfit it with a GPS tracker. Really, the manufacturer should be putting them in then. It's all a reaction to a spike in the number of vehicle thefts. According to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, in 2022, claims paid out exceeded $1 billion for the first time. Police say 2023 Toyota Highlanders like this one are a target, so this owner has locked it down. He has a disc lock on the steering wheel. You have to punch a code in to start the engine. It has an OBD blocker to stop thieves from reprogramming the ignition. And it has a GPS tracking device installed at the request of the insurance company. Those companies say manufacturers need to update anti-theft measures. And some people are hoping the government will force action when it hosts a national summit on auto theft next week. Really, it's uh, building a vehicle and designing a vehicle uh, with the technology and the effectiveness uh, to prevent theft is really the key. New regulations out last summer do require manufacturers to install anti-theft devices, but the standards haven't been adopted yet, and manufacturers don't see them as necessary. It's not just an auto theft issue. We would say it's an organized crime issue. Um, the organized criminal, criminals are uh, both technically savvy and very well financed. CBC News asked Transport Canada if it will be adopting the new anti-theft standards. We haven't heard back. When engine immobilizer devices were made mandatory in all new vehicles in 2007, there was an immediate effect. Auto thefts dropped by half. Philip Lishanok, CBC News, Toronto. Pickleball's newfound prominence is leading to an unlikely partnership. I think a perfect night is having all the courts full. I think the music blasting. I think people laughing. How failed department stores are finding new life. Plus, a gold medal winning Canadian. A wicked top shelf goal for Sarah Nurse of Canada. Opens up about becoming a role model and the future of women's hockey. I hope one day, you know, young girls, girls who are in my position, are just talking hockey. And how Canada's cap on international students could hurt higher education. We might see an impact on the number, the breadth and depth of programming that we can provide. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. is Italian Yannick Sinner winning his first Grand Slam title at the Australian Open. He defeated his much more seasoned opponent, Daniel Medvedev, in a major comeback. Sinner lost the first two sets. He even told his team at one point that he was dead. But then he went on to win the next three sets. Sinner, the first Italian to win the tournament, and one of the youngest, just 22 years old. Here at home, another racket sport has people fighting for time on the court. Jamie Strashen shows us the creative new plan for more places to play pickleball. I'm trying to put it in that square there. At this Toronto area pickleball club, space is always at a premium. Too many players and not enough courts. It's housed in an old hockey arena whose full-time tenant is actually a badminton club. The badminton club takes three quarters of the time. We only have eight to 12 uh, Monday to Friday, and uh, it's really not enough time. Finding space to play is an issue across the country for a sport that until a few years ago few had even heard of. In 2023, Pickleball Canada estimates about a million people play it at least once a month. It's such a social game and you get to meet people and uh, it's a very easy game to play. It's an extremely hard game to play well. The game is like a miniature version of tennis, played with paddles and a harder, less bouncy ball, and has been especially attractive to older athletes, like this 93-year-old club regular. Every time I hit a nice shot, you know, I feel good about it. That appeal is driving creative efforts to find more space. I've never seen a sport sort of enter the cultural conversation like pickleball has in the last couple of years. At this suburban Toronto mall, a vast retail space that used to house a Target store will soon be home to nine new pickleball courts. The company behind this one says plans are underway to do the same at other malls in the GTA and Vancouver. The hope? To breathe life into dormant spaces with a new reason to visit the mall. I think 
there's definitely a supply and demand opportunity right now. Where are people playing pickleball outside of the YMCA's? We've heard church basements converting. This is just going to fit what people are looking for. Players won't have club fees, just pay by the hour, and access to a restaurant and bar would be part of the design. I think a perfect night is having all the courts full. I think the music blasting, I think people laughing. An emerging sport revitalizing unused space, reaching a new demographic, and giving people more places to play. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Now the National goes deeper into the story shaping our world. Capping international students stokes fears of high-impact budget cuts. We have to face the fact the bill is being footed by international students. But first... A wicked top shelf goal! Olympic gold medalist Sarah Nurse tells us how women are winning with a new league of their own. Little girls being like, I can't believe that like I have a league to play in one day. Despite early promise, a hockey career was often seen as a pipe dream. When you're done doing the little thing that you're doing, you're going to need something else to do. Now she revels in her league success. That's like Olympic numbers. That's like gold medal game numbers. This is The Breakdown. On Canada's Olympic hockey team, she set a record and made history. I sat down with Sarah Nurse to hear more about her remarkable achievements and what they mean to her. I don't know that people fully understand all that has gone into getting this league off the ground, both off the ice and, and on the ice. And now, here you are, professional hockey player, Sarah Nurse. How does that feel? It's crazy to officially have that title and to be able to be a part of the inaugural season of the PWHL. It's, it's, it's kind of a roller coaster. And to be able to sit back and say, oh my gosh, I'm a professional hockey player, um, it's an honor. Look at the faces, look at the support, look at all of it that you have fought and battled for on the shoulders of the past generation to the present and all the young ones out there. They are looking at their future opportunities. Such an unbelievable moment. I've got chills. You must have thought about this, uh, the impact that even these first few weeks is having on six, seven, eight-year-old girls who either are playing hockey or want to play hockey. Yeah, the amount of times I've gotten, you know, messages or gotten tagged on social media of the gravity of what we've accomplished in the last year and in the last few weeks um, has been absolutely incredible. Like little girls being like, I can't believe that like I have a league to play in one day. Um, women who are in their 40s or 50s or 60s being like, I cannot believe you guys did this. I've always wanted to play hockey. That's all I wanted to do, but there were no opportunities for me. So it's been this full circle moment of young girls, older women, um, and also men and boys as well mm -hmm. who are really understanding. Like I get stopped at our practice facility all the time by boys, you know, wanting to talk to me about hockey and, and talking about how cool it is that we have a professional league. Yeah. Uh, speaking of full circle, let's go back to the six, seven, eight year old Sarah Nurse in Hamilton. Not that far away geographically, but it seems so far away in terms of your, your hockey journey. How did you choose hockey? How did you get involved? I started skating when I was about three years old, and my dad, he always wanted to play hockey, uh, but was never able to. He was a huge hockey fan, huge Toronto Maple Leafs fan. And so as soon as he could get me on the ice, he put me on skates. I had those little double blades, and we um, went out and skated at like a local pond together. And I was very natural at it. I took to it very easily, and I loved it. And so the natural progression from there was like figure skating or hockey. And my dad took that as an opportunity um, to put me in hockey. And that's where like I fell in love with the game. I loved playing the game so much. I definitely played other sports growing up, but... Mm -hmm. I quickly learned throughout like my early teens that my skill set and um, what I was best at was hockey. Yeah, and, and it's pretty clear as we visited uh, your, your, your parents' place in Hamilton that he and your mom are incredibly proud of you. Um, they've built basically a little museum, a little mm -hmm. Sarah Nurse Museum <laughs> in, in Hamilton. So this is the shrine to our kids where we keep all of their memorabilia, all the stuff they did. This is Sarah's shelf. We have, you know, her first 50 goal puck. There was her first international goal when she was playing U18 uh, against Germany. 
Now this Barbie doll here is her Barbie doll that is made to look like her in her image. And here's, this is the stick. The stick of the first Olympic goal. A wicked top shelf goal. The first of her Olympic career for Sarah Nurse of Canada. Four years later, you made the Canadian Olympic team won a gold medal and didn't just win a gold medal, but you were, you set the record for the women's Olympic hockey tournament, most assists, most points. So one line should be Sarah Nurse, member of what may be one of the greatest Canadian women's <laughs> Olympic teams, right, yeah. from that year. Yeah. Another line that's come out of that is Sarah Nurse, the first black uh, women's hockey player to win a gold medal at the Olympics. So first of all, in terms of terminology, I've seen you use both the word black and biracial mm -hmm. to describe yourself. Which do you prefer? I usually refer to myself as a biracial black woman. Okay. Um, <laughs> so a little bit of a combination of it too. Mm -hmm. Just, um, I think it's important for me, there are so many levels of um, you know, blackness. And for me, understanding that I have an inherent privilege just being a lighter skinned woman. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very important for me to understand and e exemplify that, that I may not necessarily go through some of the things that some of my darker sisters would. Mm -hmm. has, has race been an obstacle for you in your career? Mm -hmm. I think for myself, um, growing up, we were always the only black family in the arena. And so, like, I always joke around saying, like, I always knew where my dad was because I would just have to look out and he was the only black man <laughs> in all the white faces. Yeah. So um, definitely that was a little polarizing as a child. And then growing up with women's hockey, I remember somebody asking me a few years back if there was racism in women's hockey. And I was like, I mean, I, I'm not really sure. But then I took a look around and I was like, well, there are no other black people. There are no Asian people. There are no indigenous people. Um, the first time I ever played with somebody who wasn't white was on the 2018 Olympic team. And that was with my teammate, Bridget Laquette. Mm -hmm. And so it was crazy because I was like, there are just, there's no diversity in the sport at all. And so to be able to see players like, you know, Sophie Jakes and Soraya Tinker and um, Layla Edwards coming up and being, you know, black woman playing on their respective national teams and in professional hockey um, is going to help change the game and going to help make the game more inviting and open and welcoming to everybody. You may not have seen a lot of other faces that look like yours when you were really young playing hockey, but you certainly saw a lot of elite athletes just in your family, right? I mean, your your aunt, who was a basketball star at Syracuse, uh, your cousins, uh, Kia, uh, a basketball star, professional player, uh, Darnell, a uh, professional hockey player. So it sounds like a fantastic environment to, to achieve success. Uh, what about being a girl growing up in Hamilton playing hockey? Did you feel there were any obstacles there? I think from a very young age, because Darnell and I are the exact same age, we played the same sport and our paths always ran parallel to each other. And I always noticed how him and his career was spoken about versus mine. So we were both elite. We were both at the top of our age groups, um, our teams, our province, our country. And I remember whenever he was spoken about, it was like, well, he's going to make a living playing this. This is going to be his full-time career. He can 100% focus his time on this. Whereas me, it wasn't spoken about like that. It was spoken about, oh, you need to get an education because when you're done doing the little thing that you're doing, you're going to need something else to do. Mm -hmm. And so my career and me playing my sport wasn't taken as seriously as his was, but that was because there was no pro professional hockey for women. Mm -hmm. And the lack of opportunities was glaring to the people who I looked up to the people around me and they wanted to make sure that I had my things in order so that I could be as successful as possible outside of hockey. Now there was professional women's hockey before the current league, mm -hmm. but it sounds like it wasn't that professional. Mm -hmm. I mean, can I ask what were the salaries like in those, those leagues that came before the current league? Um, when I first started playing in the CWHL in 2018, 2019, I was paid $2,000, I believe my contract was. Um, and so then 2000 a game, 2000 a year, <laughs> yeah, 2000 a year, um, with a possible bonus at the end Wow! and maybe a couple thousand more. Mm -hmm. Um, so the difference between almost like an honorarium mm -hmm. and, and what now I hope is a salary that people can actually live on. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, 
one of the distinctions about this new women's league is that it may be the first league ever where there was a collective bargaining agreement in place before the first face-off. Mm -hmm. um, the season is sold out. Mm -hmm. You're on network television. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the highlights are on Sportsnet and TSN. How are you feeling about where things are at right now? Mm -hmm. I'm very proud to see the amount of media that's covering our league because we've never seen that before. Um, the numbers from our first game, I saw 2.9 million across Canadian broadcast networks. And that's like Olympic numbers. Mm -hmm. so that's like gold medal game numbers. And so um, the fact that there's that much interest and the fact that people know about it, because we played on TV before, but there's been no awareness. And so for me to be watching like Hockey Night in Canada the other day mm -hmm. with my family and like my face pops up saying Toronto's playing Montreal this week. I was yep. like, oh, I forgot. Amazing. <laughs> but it's so cool to be able to see that because we're in the forefront. We're front and center and people have access to us like they've never had before. And some of the athletes are front and center and as, uh, you are definitely one of them. And, and one of the interesting things about kind of the, the, the public persona you have is that on the one hand, you play this sport that's rough and tumble and aggressive and there's body checking mm -hmm. in this league. Um, but at the same time, you're not afraid to embrace this, I mean, can I say, kind of very sort of feminine uh, image on Instagram, for example. Like, what, what's, how do you balance that? What's, what, what kind of image are you hoping to portray? Yeah, I've always struggled with this because as a child, like, again, I played so many different sports, but I loved a dress. I loved playing with dolls. And so there was one time I walked into my hockey game at like seven years old with a dress on and like my hockey stick slung over my shoulder. And that's just me. Like, that's how I've always been. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to be the person that like seven-year-old Sarah could look up to and be like, oh my gosh, I could be like her because I didn't have anybody to look up to in that lens, um, playing sports, playing hockey, I was always taught that I had to be like brutal and like vicious. And I was like, that's just simply not me. Um, <laughs> on the ice, I'm a competitor, but off of the ice, these are my interests. And I think that that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that feminine, femininity is a sliding scale. I think that my version of femininity is going to be different than, you know, the next woman or the next man's version of femininity. And I just want to allow everybody the space to understand that they can be who they want to be. I like hockey. It's not who I am. It's something that I do. But I can also like so many other things. And they can be combined. It's pretty awesome. The average male professional hockey player is usually asked probing questions about getting pucks in deep or how the power play went. Do you ever get tired of having to answer the kinds of questions I've asked you today about all these bigger issues? Mm -hmm. Definitely. A hundred percent I do. Um, but I think that it's been so important because we have to share a story and we have to continue the movement and it's important for the next generation of female athletes. And so to be able to speak about this is so important. And now being a professional hockey player, I'm seeing the other side of the glass and I am answering questions about getting pucks in deep and <laughs> what's going on with our power play and why we're not being successful. Like Toronto media, they're kind of rough. So. Um, it's great. I think it's great. Now I get to answer questions about both and I hope one day, you know, young girls, girls who are in my position are just talking hockey. So it's, it is interesting when you go to the website for the league and it invites people to join the movement. So the players and the teams have done their part to start that movement and now the test is going to be on fans in terms of going to games and watching on TV. It's going to be kind of a symbiotic relationship between fans and players to grow women's hockey. Coming up, why capping international students could cost Canadians more, and later. It's got a real wonder to it. A massive shipwreck appears on the shores of Newfoundland, the speculation on its origins in our moment. Major concerns on campus over the new federal cap on international students. So a decrease in that is a decrease in funds. Reducing hiring. It means stress and uncertainty. You have got to be kidding me. And domestic students also stand to lose. Deanna Sumanag Johnson breaks down how colleges and universities will be forced into tough choices as the cash they've come to count on sharply declines. This is not easy for them. Saddam Ro is no stranger to assisting international students in crisis, but her phone's been ringing off the hook this week. 
many of our members from across the country have sent me emails and texts saying that they're stressed, they're sick to their stomachs. One part of the federal announcement to international students, their spouses won't be able to get open work permits anymore. One of the decisions that were made was to separate families of international students who are studying at the college and undergraduate levels, and families deserve to be together. The new federal announcement puts a cap on the number of international students Canada can accept over the next two years. It was presented as a measure to regulate the booming, sometimes exploitative practice of recruiting international students, many of whom are using their studies as a path to permanent residency. However, those high tuitions also fill the coffers of institutions. And there are fears that in the short term, at least, the measures could affect not only international students, but also domestic students and professors. I stopped dead in my tracks. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Vicky Kwao, studying here from Ghana, fears there'll be a tuition increase for international students. The money's going to come from somewhere else. So they turn around and put that cost on students. That question, where will the money come from with fewer international students enrolled, troubles many. Cuts to the programs that normally take in a lot of foreign students are possible. So it would mean like having to move away from tenure track faculty to, to more sessions or contract faculty, reducing hiring and, and, and uh, cutting costs in other ways. But it would also possibly mean that um, removal of some of these programs. And that would impact domestic students too. We have to face the fact the bill is being footed by international students. So a decrease in that is a decrease in funds and it's a decrease in the programs that domestic students are also in. Now we know from the federal announcement that provinces that take in the bulk of international students, specifically Ontario, are looking at a close to 50% cut, whereas other provinces may be looking at a smaller cut. What's less clear is whether the so-called diploma mills will be docked more steeply than the more reputable institutions. Even a more moderate cut could have far-reaching effects, says this president of a small public college in PEI. If we were hit with a third, um, we've got about 30% of our student population now is international, so if we had to drop that to 20, um, that we'd see an immediate impact on our bottom line, I, I think, um, and most importantly, we might see an impact on the number, the breadth and depth of programming that we can provide. Deanna, some of the people you spoke to also raised concerns that the impact here could be more than just financial. That's right, Ian. Some of the advocates and experts we spoke to are particularly concerned about the language around international students are taking away housing from Canadians. They worry that that language could lead to exclusion and xenophobia. And they remind us that in reality right now, domestic and international students aren't segregated. They work on class projects together. They may be friends. They may be dating. They may be roommates. For example, that young woman from Ghana studying in Newfoundland that you met in the piece, she's so integrated into her campus life, she's the VP of her campus's student union. Deanna Sumanag Johnson in our Toronto studio. Thanks, Ian. Next, a mysterious discovery in Newfoundland. I was like just thinking about stuff, like what happened to it and the people that was on the ship and what went on that day. The shipwreck's sudden emergence in our moment. You're looking at a shipwreck just off Cape Ray, Newfoundland. Its proximity to shore is catching the attention of locals, adding to the intrigue it wasn't there just a few days ago. The vessel is about 24 meters long, its age and content still unknown. Tonight, its mysterious appearance is our moment. This is a very significant sized vessel just sitting there next to that very white sandy beach. So earlier this week, a young man named Gordon Blackmore was actually up hunting. And I guess he was the first to see it. I think there's a, a mystique when it comes to uh, shipwrecks. From there, it's just sort of exploded in terms of attention being paid to it. I found out about it on Facebook, actually. So I decided to take my drone and go up and look at it. I was surprised on what was there and how big it was flying. I was like just thinking about like what happened to it and it, like the people that was on the ship and what went on that day. So. It was, uh, it was pretty neat. Right now, I don't even be speculating, but I've heard uh, different people who are doing some research, whether we're talking 17th century, 18th, 19th, uh, is it a British uh, warship? 
what kind of schooner this might be. It's got a real wonder to it. I think everybody feels the same way. And what comes next? And looking back in history, it's just mesmerizing. It truly is, and not to lose sight of the fact that it likely was a maritime tragedy, that there were lives involved, but uh, but still to imagine it's probably more than 200 years old. There are certain clues like the wooden trowels that appear to be used as, as nails to hold it together, um, and the fact that probably Hurricane Fiona dislodged it from where it was. So, yeah, an intriguing mystery. Thanks for being with us. You can watch anytime, anywhere on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannah-Mansing in Vancouver. Good night.